We have outdoor air quality standards in many countries worldwide, which has been useful for improving our outdoor air quality. But we spend on average 90% of our time indoors. And so if we're worried about health, we should be thinking more about the indoor air. And it's not just for the respiratory virus pandemic. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening? With me, your host, Chris Hayes. So I think everybody knows that there was a time in countries like the U.S. or the U.K. particularly where waterborne illness was common. There's there's very famously a cholera outbreak in London, uh, which is the subject of a phenomenal book by Stephen Johnson called Ghost Map, in which, you know, people started getting cholera and a bunch of kind of infectious disease experts figured out using this map that this was because it was from a contaminated well. And if you've traveled across the world, one of the key indicators often of development, the development level of a country, is the cleanliness of its water supply, right? Can you drink the water? You know, it's even like a cliche, like don't drink the water. People would say that about Mexico when, you know, 20 years ago. By the way, Mexico City has like perfectly good water now. It's, <laughs> I happen to know this because I have a friend who's like an anthropologist who literally studies the Mexican city, Mexico City water supply. But um, water quality as a indicator of development was this kind of key metric. And it said something about the ability of a society to marshal collective public resources to create the conditions for public health and sanitation. And, you know, it would seem really crazy if the solution for London to cholera was, well, everybody just filter your water. You know, (laughs) if in 2022, like they never went through the collective process to improve water quality, in a collective way, right? So that what came out of the tap was drinkable and instead said, yeah, you know, eh, the water's not great, but, you know, do what you can. See if you could buy a filter, maybe buy bottled water. That's not the way we deal with water quality. Same thing is true for outdoor air pollution. We have the Clean Air Act, which regulates outdoor air pollution. The levels of outdoor air pollution tend to be quite correlated with levels of, of wealth and development in a country. Countries that are in the process of developing rapidly often have a lot of air pollution to deal with. Air pollution is incredibly, incredibly dangerous and bad for people. In fact, every week, it seems, we learn more about how bad air pollution is for people, for the development of children's brains, for long-term health effects, life expectancy, all these things. Then there's the question of indoor air. Indoor air, we don't really think about it. I never thought about indoor air quality once in my life before the year of 2020. I mean, sometimes you'd be like, oh, this room's stuffy. Let me open a window or, you know, oh, it's, you know, cold or I'm going to put it in an HVAC unit. But it never occurred to me that there was anything even to think of about the air circulating in, say, 30 Rockefeller Center, the place that I work, to think of one way or the other along the metrics of health, the way that you might think about water when you travel or outdoor air quality. And then, of course, this big thing happened, which is that a -a once-in-a-century pandemic of a airborne respiratory virus started getting around. And the more we learned, the more we learned that indoor air quality was an enormously important thing, that close quarters indoors with insufficient airflow filtering or outside air coming in was going to produce conditions in which lots of people got the virus. And You know, one way to think about all this is, well, we have masking and that helps. But masking is a little bit, to take the analogy, it's a little bit like telling people in London during the cholera thing to boil your individual water, right? What we would like to get to is a universe in which we have just created the conditions, the regulatory structure, so that indoor air is as clean as it can possibly be, whether that's in schools, train stations, public places, places of worship, you know, concert venues, karaoke bars, all the places that inside that people congregate, that we have a set of technologies and regulations that are deployed that, you know, won't completely get rid of the risk of transmission of airborne viruses, but would greatly reduce it. And right now, it seems like we're not doing a ton on that front. And yet, it seems to me one of the most promising and one of the most important. And so I wanted to talk to a person who just thinks about this, just thinks about airborne transmission of viruses, and air quality and indoor air quality. So today, we're going to talk to Dr. Lindsay Marr. She is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Virginia Tech. She has expertise in airborne transmission of viruses, air quality, nanotechnology. She's a fellow of the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate. 
She serves on the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Board of Environmental Studies and Toxicology, and she's a member of the American Association for Aerosol Research. Dr. Marr, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about some of my favorite topics. Well, let me start with that metaphor, if that scans to you, like this idea of water quality and outdoor air pollution as, you know, threats to public health, threats to public well-being that have to be tackled through collective public effort and regulation through a public health framework. And that's something that we should now be applying in the realm of indoor air. Absolutely. The waterborne disease analogy really resonates with me because I was trained in environmental engineering and environmental engineers are formerly known as sanitary engineers or sewage engineers mm. are the ones who helped bring about the water treatment that you know we have. We can turn on our taps and drink the water. The water goes down the tap and it doesn't end up totally polluting our rivers, ideally, because we set up all these treatment systems. And that was maybe 100 years ago. Before that, you couldn't just take that for granted. Um, and waterborne disease was one of the major causes of death, especially for young people. And so now we're at a point where we're realizing, that, oh, we have all this airborne disease around, not just COVID-19, but probably colds and the flu. The flu in the U.S. kills an average of 30,000 people per year, far more than that worldwide. Um, and we're at a similar point where, oh, maybe it's time for a revolution in our indoor air where we spend about 90% of our time, we're breathing this all the time, and it's making us sick, not just with diseases, but also other pollutants in the air. Um, and I think we're at a point where things are going to shift and we'll have kind of much healthier air in our buildings if we start addressing this problem. How did you get interested in this topic? I did not know this. I mean, obviously, people can study anything and everything in the world. So you're constantly learning new areas of you know inquiry. I never even occurred to me that this was a thing that people studied or were experts in, just because I think we all take it for granted. Like, how did you get into this topic? Yeah, well, as you mentioned earlier, outdoor pollution, people recognize that. And that's where I got my start, looking at emissions from cars and trucks and how they um, move around in the atmosphere and undergo reactions and how they affect our health. But then, you know, I kind of realized, well, we actually spend 90% of our time indoors and the air indoors is not equal to the air outdoors. There's different sources, and obviously with pathogens coming from humans, those are more indoors than outdoors. So I was studying indoor air, and then I had kids 14 years ago, my first child. And that really changed everything for me in my whole life, obviously, but also in my research, because he started daycare, and you know we'd get the phone call every one or every week or two of, your son is sick, you need to come pick him up. And I'd go pick him up, and I'd find out that, well, half the kids in the room were sick all at once, or you know, even more than that. Sometimes three quarters of the kids were sick. And I knew this daycare center had really good hygiene practices, lots of washing your hands, wiping down surfaces. And so I started to wonder, well, you know, could the diseases be transmitted through the air? Because that would be much easier, right? Everyone's there sharing the air all day. I did some reading in the literature, scientific papers, and I was surprised to find out that we did not even know really how the flu was spread, whether it was through direct touching or maybe people coughing on you or possibly through the air. I think people thought we knew, but some of the explanations that I saw just didn't make sense with my understanding of how particles move in the air. And viruses are really just another type of particle and they obey the same laws of physics as our particle air pollution does. So uh, it's funny you say that because it is such a distinct moment of being a parent where as soon as you start putting them in environments with other kids, they start getting sick a lot. And then you start getting sick, then the household's sick all the time. And then, and it makes you realize, you're like, oh, like I remember being a kid and getting sick a fair amount. And then I remember a period of my life as a young adult where like, it just didn't happen. Maybe it happened once or twice a year. And now I'm back here where like there's a cold going around all the time. And clearly there's one variable that's changed. It's that I have a kid who's in a contained indoor setting with other kids all the time who is now a vector. This is all pre-COVID for me, a vector of transmission. And it is a rude awakening, but it's funny that I think we all just take it for granted, right? Like you just think, well, kids are snotty kind of, they're touching each other. Like, of course they're getting each other sick, but you had the thought of like, maybe this is preventable. Yeah, I mean, I think we, 
a hundred years ago, people just kind of lived with waterborne diseases like cholera, which you mentioned. It was not unusual for someone to have their younger sibling die during childhood. And right now, we just kind of live with colds and the flu. We just accept them as part of a way of life. But, you know, I started thinking, well, you know, things change for waterborne diseases. Why can't they change for airborne diseases? And really, for the past two years, I, I don't think I've had any respiratory infections. It's amazing. Uh, maybe something really mild, but nothing like, you know, usually I would get two or three per year when my kids were younger. It was kind of constant. So, you know, it's made me realize, and, and others too, but like maybe we don't have to live with this. Right now, our buildings are engineered for to have a comfortable temperature and to keep odors down um, and for energy savings. And, and really, that's it. They're not engineered with the thinking in mind of, oh, we, we should try to reduce transmission of disease in our buildings. And actually, one of the side effects of designing for good energy savings is that our buildings are tighter, the air yeah, uh, it become, can become staler, and that means that viruses and bacteria and things can build up in the air. And then, you know, if someone is sick around, then everyone else in the room is going to be breathing those viruses and bacteria too. So let's talk about airborne transmission. There's a strange story here, which is that there was real resistance on the part of a lot of people in public health to describing COVID that way. And there was a, a real debate. I mean, this was a very unsettled thing. There was back and forth the WHO and others. There was a sort of vanguard of experts who were like, it's airborne, it's airborne, it's airborne. If you look at the, of the folks in Asia, particularly in the Asian Pacific, this includes New Zealand, Australia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Singapore, Taiwan, China, Japan, South Korea. They were all kind of acting from the beginning like this is airborne masking ventilation, you know, makes sense. Why didn't we realize this? Why was this a subject to debate? What did we think? How did we think it was transmitting? And how is it actually transmitting? I never actually understood this. So uh, doctors in this country thought that colds and flus and this virus initially were transmitted mainly when people cough or sneeze and kind of in each other's face when they're close to each other and that there's these large wet droplets that you can see that come out of your mouth when you cough or sneeze and they land in someone else's eyes or on their nostrils or on their lips, right. and that that's how the disease is transmitted. And that has been kind of the conventional wisdom within the medical community for the past 50 to 100 years. But you know, I, I knew when I first started studying this 14 years ago and reading about how they think about transmission via these large wet droplets versus what they had called airborne transmission or aerosols, it just didn't make physical sense. Because when you're close to someone, well, there's a couple of things going on. First of all, when you cough or sneeze, in addition to those large visible wet droplets that are kind of gross and that you can see, there are hundreds of much smaller droplets. They're microscopic. We can't see them. We call those aerosol particles or aerosols. And when you just breathe or talk, those are coming out too those smaller ones. So those are coming out of our mouths all the time. I, you know, I know from my research and other people's that those can contain virus in these very small particles. I know from physics that you know, we learn and I teach in my class that that size of particle can remain floating around in the air for many minutes to hours. So that, that was part of it. And so as part of the conventional wisdom about how these diseases were transmitted, airborne kind of had this very special definition, which was transmitting at a long at long distance, so beyond six feet. And then it also had this special meaning in hospitals where if you say the word airborne, that means that you need to follow a certain set of procedures, including providing N95s for all the healthcare workers and putting patients into negative pressure rooms. And that is resource intensive. So you really don't want to do that uh, unless you really have to. And sorry, Negative pressure rooms have a fan blowing the air out, right? Yeah, they're sucking the air out so that if the patient is sick and they're spewing lots of viruses into the air, it all gets sucked out and removed and it doesn't spread into other areas of the hospital. And that patient would be by themselves. You couldn't have people together because if two people in a room, because then one person could transmit to the other. So this is fascinating to me. So there was a special category that was airborne illness, and then the other stuff was considered, like, assumed to be droplet? Everything is kind of assumed to be transmitted by droplets. Airborne diseases were thought to be kind of really strange, like odd ducks, weird, unusual, or rare. And so, you know, after 
much misunderstanding about measles and tuberculosis, they were finally accepted as transmitting by the airborne route. So again, just the default assumption is that diseases are transmitted by these large visible droplets. Now, interestingly, there is actually no direct evidence that a disease has been transmitted by these large direct droplets landing in our eyes, nose, or mouth. And we have lots of evidence that they're transmitted by us breathing in viruses or bacteria from the air, whether we're close to someone or whether we're far away. So I think what was happening was that transmission epidemiologically, you can see, well, people tend to get sick if they're close to another person. Well, what's, what's happening is that they're actually breathing the other person's exhaled viruses or bacteria. It's not because these large wet droplets are landing in their eyes, nose, or mouth. It's like being close to a smoker. You're breathing a lot of smoke when you're close to them than if you're compared to if you're farther away. So I think if there was some misinterpretation of that data or that observation, and there, you know, early in 2020, there was a nice paper that came out that's showing that, okay, if we consider both breathing in these microscopic particles from the air versus having these large wet droplets land on you, you have to be uncomfortably close for those large wet droplets to be more important than breathing in the aerosol particles. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing, A, it makes a lot of sense of some of the early public health messaging, which was don't touch your face, wash your hands, clean surfaces, right? Because that's all droplet focused. Those are all ways of, of mitigating what would be droplet exposure. But you're also describing, I don't think I'd quite conceptualize the size and scope of the error here. Like <laughs> back when we're talking about cholera, right? There's people that think it's like the humors or it's the, my, there's, a, there's something called the miasma theory. The air. The air, right? The bad air. The bad air. So there's this miasma theory that, People use, and there's all sorts of stuff like opening, you know, opening your wounds, blah, blah, blah. People operated on it, but it was just wrong. The cholera wasn't traveling that way. The cholera was traveling through the water. And it sounds like you're describing something like that's almost that level of wrong. (laughs) The conventional story here. Yeah, I, I, I would agree that it is quite wrong. Now, I think cholera, I think, plays into this because, you know, once people realized, oh, cholera was, was waterborne, it discounted and disproved the miasma theory of the bad hit air, bad humors. Right. Um, and so kind of that was left behind. Right. That's like a discredited theory that you don't want to go back to. So Exactly. Right. Exactly. So if you start talking bad air, it's like now you're you're invoking, it's like you're talking about bleeding people or something. Like this is a yeah. discredited theory for disease transmittal. Exactly. Now, miasma and cholera, you know, were thought to come from like bad air from dead bodies. Yep. Um, that was wafting around outside. So what we're talking about with airborne is very different. We're talking about people who are infected and are releasing viruses into the air, which are going to be just like cigarette smoke, more concentrated close to that person, and it's going to spread throughout the room. And if the room is poorly ventilated, you've no windows, no doors, no fans or anything, that can build up in the air over time, and everyone else who's in the room is going to be exposed to that. We'll end up breathing some of that. We'll be back after this quick break. All right, so it becomes clearer over time that COVID-19 is in fact transmitted in these airborne particles. Describe the physics and biology of this. So just walk me through it. Like there's these microscopic, it's a virus. Yeah. So the virus itself is very small. It's a tenth of a micron. Just for reference, your hair is about 50 to 100 microns in diameter. So we're talking about something that's really tiny. Now, if you're infected, there's lots of these virus particles in your body and in your along your respiratory tract, but they're not coming out just naked by themselves. So just in the normal course of breathing or talking and coughing and sneezing, we generate respiratory particles from the fluid that lines our respiratory tract. You could think of it as like mucousy, saliva-y type material that goes all the way down into our lungs. One way that that's generated is that in those small airways, you can imagine a straw or a really skinny straw. As it opens and closes, there's this kind of film of layer, like a like if you're blowing bubbles, mm-hmm. that kind of forms across there. And as the airway opens, that kind of stretches out and it breaks and it poofs and it creates these mi- tiny microscopic particles of respiratory fluid. That fluid is not just water. It also contains salts and proteins, mucousy, snotty stuff. And the viruses could be in there too. 
So these, you know, you exhale, talk, or sing, just breathe out, Shout. and those come out. They, some of them might be carrying viruses in them. They are very small. They range in size anywhere from, well, the smallest one you could have would be, you know, the virus size of the virus, but the virus isn't naked, so it's probably in things that are a little larger, um, all the way up to um, things we can see. But the ones that we can't see are far more numerous. There's probably hundreds of them for every one that you can see. And those come out into the air. They evaporate a little, so a little of the water is lost, but there's still a lot of salts and proteins and other gunk left behind along with any virus. Those are small enough to remain floating around in the air for a while. They kind of span a range of sizes and they can, you know, they'll be just like, they'll behave like cigarette smoke particles and that they're more concentrated close to the person who released them, who was anyone really. And they travel more than six feet, right? Cigarette smoke doesn't just stop at six feet and it can fill a room if it's poorly ventilated. And if you're outdoors, obviously it becomes rapidly diluted and it's not as much of a problem. Right. Cigarette smoke is, I think, useful conceptually. Just it's helping me conceive of what we're talking about. Do people have the reaction that do they get grossed out when you're talking about this? Because I find it like, it's weird. <laughs> it's weirdly like, it's like, oh, there's all this mucus and gunk and proteins floating around. It's like, I guess that's just what it is to be a human breathing air around other humans. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. I mean, I've shown some videos before that um, I think they were from the New Zealand Public Health Department from years ago, but they show people in slow motion uh, sneezing, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's really pretty gross because yeah. you that's where the visible things right. you know, that you can see. So we have to use our imagination because these are things we can't see. But, you know, people have talked about well, sharing the air. It's kind of like being in a swimming pool with someone who's peed in there, maybe. Right, right. <laughs> So these are suspended in there. How long can they last in the air? So if you're in a room, let's say you're in a, you're in, I'm in a one room, like studio structure right now, pretty small, say 400 square feet. If you were in here and you had COVID, right? And you're exhaling and then you left and then I come in the room, like, does it dissipate? Does it fall to the ground? Like, where does it go? Yeah, all, kind of all of the above. There's three main ways it can be removed. The first is through ventilation, which is the air in your studio probably changes out. Even if you don't have doors open, air comes through cracks and things around the edges of the doors and windows and other, other ways. Um, it probably changes out every one to two hours. So some of those particles are small enough that they can remain floating around for more than that. So they're just hanging out until the entire air moves out of your studio, which would be one to two hours. Some of the ones that are a little bit larger could hang around. They'll, they may fall to the ground. The bigger ones fall faster than the smaller ones. Um, the things that we're talking about probably take anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours to fall to the ground. But if they haven't fallen to the ground within a couple hours, they've probably been removed by the ventilation effect. And then the other thing is that because we're talking about a biological organism, even if it's still physically present, it can die off over time. Right. And so studies have shown, though, that this virus is pretty hardy and it seems to survive for in these aerosol particles for, for hours anyway. So that doesn't seem to be a limiting factor. Then when I inhale it, so let's say we're just to keep tracking the transmission. So there's some parts per million, I guess, of, of virus in the air. I mean, I don't know how you quantify it, right? Like, oh, uh, yeah, we talk about, you know, so many viruses per volume of air that you breathe in. Yeah. Okay. So there's some quantity and I'm breathing it in, you know, let's say I'm in a, you know, I was at a, <laughs> there was these two weeks of New York in December, basically after Thanksgiving, like one weekend after another weekend where it was like, oh, we're a vaccine boosted and we're not going to go through another COVID winter. And so-and-so is having a birthday party and so-and-so is having a holiday party. And we're going to go to those. And <laughs> then like literally the next day it was like, well, everyone at the party got Omicron, right? So and this was before we realized, you know, how much Omicron was out there. But so you're at a party. You, this is perfect transmission, right? The music's loud. I'm like shouting at you to be heard, which is why bars we know are just like the worst, right? I'm shouting at you to be heard because I'm shouting the force is I, I'm expelling even more than I normally would. So there's more and more in the air. And you're also like leaning in. You're trying to hear me and you're so you're inhaling it. What happens with the virus when it enters your 
air passageway. Yeah, so you inhale, it goes in through your nose or your mouth. Um, it's in these respiratory particles. Those are going to, depending on how big they are, they could deposit, like they could kind of come into contact, touch down, let's say, on the inside of your nose or maybe the inside of your throat, or maybe they'll get even deeper down into your lung. And they, um, you know, the larger ones could either settle or, or as they're going around the curves in your respiratory passages, you know, the air is moving fast and they're too big to make the turn. So they like slam into the inside of your nasal passages. Or another way is that if they're really small, then they have a bit of random motion to them. And this is also how masks and N95s are able to filter out really tiny particles smaller than the holes between them. But anyway, really small particles have this random motion associated with them, almost like I like to say a drunk stumbling around, and they may stumble into the walls of your respiratory passages and then stick there. And then that's where my knowledge ends, and we need to talk to a virologist about kind of what happens at that point. Right, because then they bind on with the receptors and they get in there and they start Right. right. They get into the cells and right. they start replicating. Right. So I guess the next question then becomes like how to think about airflow and ventilation inside structures. So I just had this very interesting experience, which was the opposite of this, because you and you you referenced it before, so I'm gonna call it back, which is that I did a weatherization efficiency upgrade on a house where they do what's called a blower door test. And they they create negative pressure by you close all the windows, you open the door, they like sort of zip a fan in and the fan is blowing out at like 60 miles an hour. So there's incredible negative pressure. And what you're testing is that negative pressure is sucking air into the house and you're able to sort of sense, you can even put your hand places and you can feel where outside air is coming in or you can use a heat gun, which is also really cool because if like you're doing it in the summer, for instance, you can see where the hot air is coming in. And then they went about sealing up the house because it was incredibly inefficient, right? So that's one way to think about like efficiency. First of all, what's the basic dynamics by which air enters and leaves an indoor space? Like, let's just start at the most fundamental way of like, how does that happen? It's most obvious if you open a window or door. The wind's blowing and it blows air through there. There's also, because we always have these cracks, I'm, I'm glad you went through the process of trying to seal up the cracks. There's always those types of cracks and things around and so there's temperature differences, like the air, the ceiling is warmer than the air near the floor. And so that sets up these kind of thermal forces that move the air around and between inside and outside, you have differences in temperature. And so the air is going to want to come in or out through those cracks. If you have wind blowing on the building, even if you have the doors and windows closed, air can come in through these cracks under the door and other, even just like kind of where walls and ceilings and floors meet. Those are areas where the air can, what we call, infiltrate. And then if you have an HVAC system, some kind of forced air heating, cooling system, then that actually intentionally brings in some outdoor air. Some systems bring in all outdoor air, some bring in just a fraction of outdoor air, but that's another way that the air is moving through, that you're getting outdoor air moving through your residence. So in the structures that we spend a lot of time in, which are schools, office buildings, large public spaces, and homes when we don't have the windows open. <laughs> like a lot of that is our HVAC systems, basically, right? I mean, you know, if you're designing a large office building, right, a big part of that design is going to be the airflow, right? Oh, yeah. There are engineers who are dedicated to designing and installing HVAC systems, and there are standards that they are supposed to meet that are put out by a professional organization called ASHRAE for the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers. And so the system that they install is supposed to be designed, depending on whether you have a gym or a school or a nursing home or a restaurant, it's designed to put a certain amount of air through there. And so the initial intent is there. Often they may not be maintained and operated correctly. So you may not get the intended performance. Are the standards written as they exist with the idea of airborne illness in mind? Absolutely not. They are written with the idea of odors in mind. Ah. And I'm actually serving on one of the committees that is revisiting these standards to think about how we might update them to account for the spread of disease 
indoors. So my next question becomes like, how solvable is a problem is this with proper ventilation? Because it just seems to me like you've got all these particles and you've got people around each other. They're going to be in the same space. Like, how good can you make it such that it's just like whisking the virus like right out of their mouth? Yeah, you, you'd have to have pretty high ventilation to do it right out of your mouth. But there are, you know, we know there are studies that have shown that if you have kind of higher ventilation, you have less incidence of tuberculosis in one study or of other respiratory diseases like colds. That was a study done in a dormitory in Maryland by a team at University of Maryland. And so we know that, you know, there is empirical evidence, observational evidence. We also have just based on fundamental understanding of how viruses move around in the air, that if we have better ventilation, that will bring down the amount of virus in the air, fewer people will get sick. Hospitals do this. They have to have, we talked about in your studio, maybe the air changes over every one or two hours in hospitals. That happens every, every like four to six minutes or four to, four to 10 minutes. Wow. So it's much faster. So you, you know, that's possible. I don't know if that's practical for all other buildings, but there are other things you can do besides ventilation to reduce the amount of virus in the air. And those include filtration. And also there's a germicidal UV treatment, which are very effective too. So with filtration, you're just removing the particles from the air. With germicidal UV treatment, you are very effectively killing off the, the virus in the air. Now, these things are work kind of at the room scale, but if you are really close to someone and, and you're, you know, you're at the birthday party and you're yelling because it's loud and they're close because it's loud, these things we've talked about, the ventilation, filtration, and UV, they're not going to help much because you know, there's no time for those, those respiratory particles before they go from the other person's mouth to your, your face. There's no time for them to pass through the ventilation system or filtration system or be inactivated or killed off by UV. And so that's where um, you know, masks are, are quite useful. You know, kind of outside of those situations, ventilation can make a big difference. So let's talk about those two, the, the filters and the, the germicidal UV. Can you just walk through? I mean, I, we have, we've purchased a few HEPA filters at different points in the pandemic. We've, we actually used them for our holiday gatherings. We had people here, we had everyone take a rapid test. And then as a kind of backup, we put the HEPA filters on. I think it's an added, probably an added layer at the margins of protection. It's not going to like stop people from getting COVID, but did that make sense? <laughs> oh yeah. No, I think HEPA filters can be really useful. And I would say not marginal, but can be very, uh, one of the very effective layers of prevention by, again, reducing the amount of virus that's in the air. Again, if you have like a smoke filled room and you turn on your HEPA filter, that can really filter out those particles. Well, the key thing is to look for a portable air cleaner or HEPA air filter unit that passes enough air through it that you're actually going to bring down the amount of virus and other particles in the air. Because if it just has just a small amount of air passing through it, um, it's only treating a small amount of the air. So it, in order for it to work, the air in the room has to pass through it. So it needs to have high enough of what we call the clean air delivery rate for the size of the room that you're in. So that's the number to look for? You're looking for a high clean air delivery rate. Sometimes they talk about, oh, this air cleaner is sized for a certain area of room, so many square feet. So you definitely want to get one that's sized for your room or better yet, if you want an extra protection, get one that's even bigger, bigger than you need. Oh, I see. So they'll, they'll size them for the square footage. Yeah. Sometimes they'll advertise it for a certain amount of square feet. Go big. You know, this connects, we'll get back to germicidal UV, but this connects to a question I've had. So we've, you know, Schooling has been a very contentious issue, and for understandable reasons, you have, until recently, very large unvaccinated populations, children that were not eligible for the vaccine, now they are. But you've also got, you know, kids indoors, and to return to our original story, right, of kids as, <laughs> you know, uh, transmitters of infectious disease, like, you know, lots of stuff moves around in the school, germ-wise. So it's been very controversial. There was something like almost $200 billion in the ARP for, to improve schools and make them safer. That money got spent on lots of things, including like new football stadiums in some districts and things like that. I'm a little frustrated with it because it comes down to about a million dollars per school structure in America. And it just seemed to me like just at, at a base level, like you could just buy a HEPA filter for every room. <laughs> that would be a very effective use of the money if you are trying to reduce transmission in schools. That uh, or, you know, upgrading the HVAC system, 
older schools certainly could use that or uh, so that it can um, run more air through there or can handle more effective filters. Um, but yeah, that would have been a very good way of spending the money if you wanted to address transmission. Uh, when we say upgrade HVAC systems, what what do you mean by that? So we're talking about, you know, the system, if you have an older system, uh, it may not be capable of handling better filters. So, you know, the HVAC system has filters in there that remove particles from the air, and there are different levels of quality of filters. So there's ones that you just put in your house that probably aren't that great. They can stop leaves and big dust balls. But there's also really better quality filters that could filter out a lot of the virus. Those, however, um, it takes a little more work. It's a little harder to push the air through them. Gotcha. And so you need to have fans or blowers in your HVAC system that are capable of handling that without burning out. So that's one way of doing it or installing a system that can where you can adjust it easily to bring in more outdoor air during periods when the building is occupied. There's some cost to that because if you're bringing in more outdoor air, that means you have to do more heating or cooling. So there's there are some trade-offs. So those are a couple of the things. A lot of systems really would benefit just from some routine maintenance, make sure everything's working. You know, I've seen stories of ones that just, you know, people find out that they're not parts of it aren't working or broken and it it just needs some some attention. Well, this is the thing about HVACs is that they're actually pretty labor intensive <laughs> and like good duct work is not, it's not as it exists now. And at least in, just in my experience with it, it's a, a very hands-on part of a building and part of main, like it takes maintenance, takes cost. It takes some real expertise to make sure the system is that the duct work is air sealed, that it's well done, that it's not coming apart. Like all of those are not trivial concerns. Like you have to actually know what you're doing. Yeah. And Additionally, so, you know, do do we have enough expertise to address every school right now? No, but hopefully over, over time, we could, over a longer time frame. And then I think, you know, the HVAC system is, nobody sees it really, or even, or thinks about it. And so, you know, spending money on it's not the, not the first thing that comes right. to most people's mind. So talk about germicidal UV, because that seems more, I, that I've not encountered. HEPA filters, we own a few, and th- th- those are fairly straightforward. Yeah, germicidal UV is used very effectively in hospitals uh, in certain areas. And there's a couple of ways of doing it. One is that you can have UV in the HVAC system. So it's the filters can remove virus. Oh, wow. Germicidal UV can kill off the virus, and you don't need a filter. But it has to be well-designed so that there's enough time for virus to be exposed to the UV light to kill it off. If it just whooshes by and that's it, that may not be enough to kill the virus. There's other, another way of doing it is putting it in the room, what we call upper room UV. And that would be where you put it kind of up towards the ceiling because UV light can be harmful to people. So you don't want people to be exposed to it. But if you put it up in the ceiling, kind of aimed upward toward the ceiling, then air that's passing by there, any viruses or bacteria will be killed off. And that can be very effective. That also requires special expertise in designing to make sure you're installing something that's going to be effective and won't harm people. I think it's worth thinking about that type of treatment in places where that are especially risky, things like a crowded school cafeteria, for example. Right, because there you've got, you can't really mask, you've got people you know, yelling, you've got people eating, there's, there's lots going on there. Yeah, the, that that is kind of one of my where would I not want to be during a respiratory virus <laughs> pandemic? And it's you know crowded. People are on these tables, you know, packed together. I've attended lunch with my kids once when they were young. Sure. It is loud in there. Yeah. People are yelling, and right, you can't wear a mask. Are there places that are doing a really good job of this to point to of sort of using whether it's new money available or thinking about it in the terms of COVID and the pandemic to really change the sort of air quality and respiratory infrastructure? There are. I've heard of a restaurant. I know one of my colleagues at the University of Colorado is consulting for, and this restaurant has installed sensors for carbon dioxide, which is in our exhaled breath. So it's an indicator of how good the ventilation is. Lower is better. Uh, They've also installed some sensors for particles in the air. Now, you have to be careful with that because there's far more other types of particles in the air than there are people's respiratory particles. There's just like dust particles and 
coming from skin flakes and dirt and other things around. So it's not really a direct measure of respiratory particles, but it can tell you something about, you know, if the level's really high and you turn on some filtration device and it comes down, it shows that your filter is working. And so I think they have also put small HEPA filters around the restaurant. Um, and I think they may even have them on, on tables. And I've heard of a restaurant in Canada that did this too. They kind of isolated different seating areas and then put a portable HEPA air cleaners on each table or in each kind of in each partitioned area. And that seems like a great idea for making diners safer during a pandemic. It also seems that, like to go back to this sort of original conceit that there has to be, I think you may, may have even tweeted about like the idea of a clean air act an indoor clean air act, that some macro intervention that says, look, we don't have to live with this level of airborne disease. There's COVID, but there's other stuff too. And there might be another pandemic down the road. And in some ways, I think one of the things that you've seen in this is that the experience of SARS had a kind of inoculating effect on the Asian Pacific region that has been much better in dealing with COVID than almost any other part of the world, partly because of the trauma of SARS and having to deal with that and recognizing this airborne and recognizing it as a respiratory illness. You know, if we were doing that here, like if you were, you and your colleagues were getting together to draw up an indoor clean air act, what, how would you, how would we think about that? Well, I would kind of use some of the ideas of the outdoor clean air act. And one of the main things there is setting standards. We have standards for outdoor air pollution, where if the amount of particles or amount of ozone in the air is higher than a certain level, then localities are required to come up with a plan to address that and try to bring the levels down. And it requires measurements, of course, to know what your air quality is outdoors. And so we have hundreds of monitoring stations around the country that measure our outdoor air. For indoor air, we have almost no information. And so I think the first step would be to setting some standards. And this would be, you know, it would take some work. We'd have to have a scientific expert committee working on this. There would be uh, disagreements, I'm sure, but I think they could work through. We have enough information available that they could come up with some metrics for easily measurable pollutants that are in indoor air, where at least we have some benchmarks or some targets so that people know, oh, is my air quality good or bad or somewhere in between? And if it's bad, then, okay, what do we need to do about it? And that brings up, you know, another part of piece of the, this kind of indoor clean air act, which is kind of providing kind of advice or, or I guess having some kind of reference about good ventilation practices and filtration and UV treatment, and then ways of, to make it easier for the average person to evaluate those systems when they're out shopping for them, because there's right now there's, it's a marketing mess really. And there's, in right. addition to the technologies I mentioned, there are other things out there that are being marketed as cleaning the air, killing off the virus that really don't do what they claim. And so, you know, something to help sort through that and make it clearer, improve transparency to the consumers of what really works and what doesn't. That's great. So like those, like, you know, the, you know, appliances have those energy ratings that are, that are regulated that, you know, you know, that they can't just make up. <laughs> what their energy rating is. Like there's actual regulation that guides that. Like something for that, for things that deal with airflow and air circulation where there's some stamp that says like, you know what you're getting here and what it will do. Yeah, exactly. The The energy star idea is a great one for this. So yeah, the indoor air star whatever, or the air star, whatever it is. Are there places that do this very well outside the US or the places that have, you know, really thought about this and, and implemented this at scale? Um, there are not a lot of indoor air standards around the world. I think there are only a few countries that I know of that have them. I think South Korea has them, and I think Taiwan has them for certain types of buildings, like schools and universities and um, train stations and public other big public buildings. I've heard that in Japan, it is not uncommon for stores to have a carbon dioxide monitor and to display that level in the window oh, wow. so people know you know, when they can decide when they're outside whether to go in or not. Uh, if, you know, if the level's high, it's like, oh no, okay, maybe I'll come back another time. And then I heard that a country in Europe had also implemented that idea of, of, of making carbon dioxide measurements more easily available to the general public. But beyond that, I'm, I'm not aware of anything 
But, you know, I think it's something we really need at this point. Uh, We have outdoor air quality standards in many countries worldwide, which has been useful for improving our outdoor air quality. But, you know, again, we spend on average 90 percent of our time indoors. And so if we're worried about health, we should be thinking more about the indoor air. And it's not just for the respiratory virus pandemic, but we're talking about asthma and other illnesses and academic performance and productivity. And so we're talking about kids and workers. You know, if they have healthy, good air, they're going to, and we as a country, will be more productive. Do we have evidence establishing that? Yeah, there there are a lot of studies showing that, you know, with better air quality, you get better, what I mentioned, like better test scores, reduced wow. absenteeism, reduced asthma attacks, reduced number of doctor's visits, and and things like that. There's also, um, I don't know if you had sent this over or tweeted it, that China has developed a bioaerosol nucleic acid detection system that they're going to use at the Winter Olympics. And I didn't quite understand what it was, but is it testing the air for COVID? I believe so. I think what it's doing, it's, so it's It's not like a new approach overall. My laboratory and other laboratories around the world do this. We collect air samples. We bring them back to the laboratory. We measure the nucleic acid and see if there's the COVID-19 virus in there. I think what the next step is that they've made this all automated. They've put it into a package that they can distribute easily to lots of different places. They don't need PhD level scientists running each one and they get the results fast. It's all kind of built into the instrument what we would do in the laboratory that would take us, you know, a day for a PhD level scientist to do. It's all automated in their box, it looks like. Something like that would be amazing, I think, if, right, if you want to go to see a movie and they have that there and they can tell you, oh, yeah, you know, our air is virus free or or at schools, for example, or workplaces even, because it's, you know, another way you could do this is, oh, you test each person, but that's, that's hard. Right. Um, if you could just measure the air around that everyone's breathing, and if you detect it, that's a, an easy indicator of, hey, we need to, you know, if you find it, we need to do something about this. It's kind of wild to me that, well, two things here. One is that, like, I don't feel like this will be the last pandemic necessarily. I think that, you know, airborne respiratory infections are a thing that we should be thinking a lot more about going forward. But in a weird way, this conversation has been more encouraging than I thought insofar as it feels like it's not some huge great leap forward we need. I mean, when I talk about climate stuff, the transition to 100% carbon-free grid and energy power system is daunting. Now, the technology is getting closer and closer. In fact, you could almost argue it's there and, you know, it's 70 or 80% there, but it's daunting. What you're describing sounds less daunting, I have to say. Like, it really doesn't sound like this is something outside of our reach if we were to focus on this and implement it and provide the resources and the regulation, that this is something that's quite doable. I agree. I mean, it's it's totally doable. We have the knowledge, we have the technologies available today to do this. And it's a matter of raising people's awareness about it, making it a priority, and putting the resources toward it. And those resources, you know, any investment, I think, will pay off in terms of reduced health costs and improved productivity. Dr. Lindsay Marr is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Virginia Tech. She studies airborne transmission of viruses and air quality. She's a member of a whole variety of uh, professional bodies that are working on this problem as well. Dr. Marr, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks. It's been fun to talk with you about this. Once again, my great thanks to Dr. Lindsay Marr. If you'd like to hear more episodes, particularly about COVID or the coronavirus coverage we've done, Dr. Peter Hotez was on talking about vaccines and vaccine efficacy. You can check that out in our archives. We'd love to hear your feedback. Send us emails, withpod at gmail.com. Tweet us the hashtag withpod. Why is this happening? It's presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. 